So let me go ahead and introduce the panel. Hopefully all of you, I'm not going to read, I won't do justice if I try to read their bios, but I'll at least just kind of tell us who you're looking at from your left all the way to your right. And, and the goal is to also just get some kind of opening thoughts, a little bit of question, and then as Dana successfully modeled to get non-soliloquy questions from the audience as, and maybe some interaction and especially kind of, I think there was a lot of, I think the panelists would agree with me, there was a lot of food for thought there. So all the way to your immediate, to your left is Dr. Jeffrey Joyce, who is, he's the chair of health policy at USC, the director of health policy at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics, and uh, someone I knew way back in the day from our time at RAND. And so he's He's had quite a few roles uh, around some of the things that I think the administrator was mentioning for education around Part D. So maybe, when Jeff, when you get into that, we can talk about that a little bit more. Next to him, Dr. Stacy Dusetsina, who's at an associate professor at UNC and also has an illustrious title, the Ingram Associate Professor of Cancer Research. Did I say UNC? I'm sorry. I, I insulted all of Vanderbilt oh, no. by doing that. <laughs> Weren't you at UNC? Yes. I, was, I thought so. Yes. Okay, I'm not completely losing my mind. Um, <laughs> Vanderbilt University Medical Center, apologies. And, and also has, just from background, a body of work that kind of not only touches on uh, the effects of pricing for cancer patients, but also looks more broadly at kind of health policy levers to impact that. And then right next to her, my friend, Dr. Sam Nussbaum, who has been a senior fellow at the Schaefer Center, and I have had the privilege of working when he was at his role at Anthem as the chief medical officer. And I think, Sam, it was on this stage two or three years ago where we were talking about hep C and talking about the cost of, of kind of the drugs in the pipeline as well as the, those that were commercially available with kind of this conundrum around affordability and optionality. So I just want to, I'll, we're each going to just kind of go through some opening thoughts and comments. And, and, you know, I love that at Brookings, it's about independence, impact, transparency, all sorts of things. Full transparency, we did not have access to the administrator's remarks. So we, we had some inkling of what was going to happen, but did not have uh, you know, none of us had had like a prepared script of what she was going to do. And, and I would just like to say that it was refreshing to hear topics like protected classes. I mean, these are kind of some of these things are slightly, you know, thought of we don't have quite the detail on it yet. And, and uh, for those of you that haven't been following the day to day plays at OMB, uh, the kind of p proposed Part D rule that people are waiting for has not been released yet. So, but there were hints protected classes. Um, some of the changes on the catastrophic side, out of pocket, things that I would say that for someone my, myself who worked on the Hill when the MMA was passed, we would like to see this benefit program being modernized, and she alluded to it. Uh, let's go ahead. Sam, do you mind starting and just giving us some opening impressions, thoughts, and any other perspectives? And we'll just go through the panel and then do some questions. Thanks, Kavita, and it's wonderful to be with all of you. And you are right. We talked about the cost of a cure. And today it's increasingly about the cost of breathtaking new therapies, the cost of cures, because when we step back, and, and I want to respond uh, very specifically to the really, I, I think, uh, innovative, uh, powerful, far-reaching uh, ideas that were expressed by Administrator Verma. But if we just step back and look at the time in which we are living, where we have such breakthrough science, the opportunities for immuno-oncology and CAR-T therapy and gene therapy and treatments that even a decade ago we could never have envisioned. So we've seen the fruits, really, of 20 years of fundamental science playing out in terms of these new therapies. But as we heard, the costs are extraordinary. And I remember, in fact, Two years ago, when I was representing Anthem on the stage, I mentioned that the total cost of drugs and the medical and pharmacy benefit to Anthem was close to 25%. And people thought that was extraordinary. Now we see we're approaching 23% for, for Medicare. So we can't sustain this, but we also have to be mindful that there are offsets to these extraordinary uh, drug costs, and that is that we can have better quality of life, longevity, 
less hospitalization. But I want to comment specifically about three domains that uh, the administrator talked about. The first I'd like to bring forward uh, some of the themes that we experienced on the commercial private plans and how those might impact uh, Medicare Part D and Part B. And I, I think I want to hark back to the fact that health plans have had a lot of flexibility on formulary designs. And the flexibility enabled plans, uh, such as you know, Anthem and other commercial payers, to basically create formularies that have one or two of the most popular branded drugs in a class, all the rest generics, and we were able to deliver to the market savings of between 15 and 20 percent if those plans were chosen. So just by formulary decisions, you can see that there can be significant cost savings. Secondly is the whole arena of prior authorization, of utilization management, of tools that by their very nature sound perhaps not compelling. They may not be compelling to patients who might see this as more limited access, but used in the right way, prior authorization and these other tools can actually guide some of the most effective therapies to follow guidelines and clinical data that's generated both in real-world evidence as well as uh, through academic studies. And that can guide more effective therapy for patients so that we don't have in cancer, for example, the 15 to 25 percent of care that is not following evidence and may not lead to the best outcomes. So if we do these approaches as is proposed, we need to be sure that patients have access to speedy review, that guidelines are made in scientific standards, uh, that there are a whole host of safeguards that are introduced. The third area that I, I would like to comment on, and I think it's, it's one that is, is again, um, can be compelling, is the whole model that the administrator talked about toward the end of value-based payments. And it's not going to be for every drug in every class, but for these extremely costly therapies, there will be value in figuring out the clinical offsets and, and not only using uh, qualities and cost effectiveness, which are time honored, but using other approaches. In fact, some, uh, uh, Dana, that you've been a, a leader in thinking through, but sort of, um, you know, whether it's workplace productivity, it's value of hope, all of these other models that can find their way into true approaches that, that make a difference. Just to, to close these first comments, several years ago, it was proposed that value-based payments become more and more um, part of the landscape, the foundation of our healthcare system. And we know that the private sector and CMS, HHS, worked together and encouraged and set goals of 30% by 2016, 50% mm -hmm. by this year, 2018. But what is lacking are these same strategies in the drug space. Those have to be included. And part of the way to begin to get there is to, as a specific policy opportunity, is to consider Part D drugs in terms of the population health payments, the value-based payments to include, as we are including, Part B drugs in the total frame of either MIPS or alternative payment models. So at the end of this, we will have you know, a system that not only can measure value, but a system that will link reimbursement to value and very much do it in a way that stimulates innovation. This is the area where the U.S. leads, and we must continue to bring new life-saving, life-changing therapies to consumers in the U.S. Great. Thank, thank you, you, Sam. Stacy, your thoughts? And I just want to say at the outset, it's okay. I would assume and hope we probably have some overlapping kind of thoughts. So in my mind... That's actually good if we can reinforce or, or have different kind of viewpoints. So your thoughts? Sure. Um, so I will start by saying that I probably spent an unhealthy amount of my own time <laughs> thinking about Medicare Part D. So I'm really excited <laughs> to be here uh, as part of this group. 
Um, so one of the things I spend a lot of time thinking about is access for patients. And I think a couple of things really struck me as part of the administrator's comments. You know, she started out saying uh, Medicare Part D is a success. And I think that that is largely true unless you happen to be one of the Americans who needs a very expensive drug. And so one of the first questions to the administrator really hit on this point well, that people who need these very expensive therapies like cancer therapies, like those for rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis, they do face very high out-of-pocket costs when they're trying to fill drugs on Medicare Part D. And they wouldn't really see the same benefits of things like passing along rebates uh, because they don't really get them to the same level as you would if you were in a more competitive area. So we have sort of the perfect storm of coverage and lack of rebates um, around those protected classes that make them really unaffordable for patients. They also, you know, while some of the um, proposals that were put forward in the blueprint, like capping out-of-pocket costs for seniors once they hit the catastrophic phase, you know, that requires a lot of money up front to get there. And I think that, you know, the question that was raised about trying to spread that payment over the course of the year to make things more affordable for patients, um, to allow patients to start a drug, is, uh, is an important question and one where I think the administration could do more. Um, you know, prior work has shown, especially for people with orally administered cancer drugs, that there's a very high rate of people leaving those drugs behind at the pharmacy. And these aren't really optional treatments for people at that stage. So I think it's something really important to keep an eye on. One other thing that I'd like to comment on, and I won't kind of keep the comments too long. I want there to be time for other discussion, is around this issue of step therapy. Um, again, thinking about access questions for patients. Um, I think it's really intriguing. When they first brought this up, I thought, wow, that's, that's a really interesting idea to think about introducing competition across Part B and Part D because we don't typically think about it that way. And if you can start to get more competition, maybe you can lower spending. But I wonder a lot about what would happen to patients' out-of-pocket spending requirements and whether patients would be harmed in that situation. The reason is, is that for Part B, most patients have supplemental insurance that helps them with their out-of-pocket costs. So if you fill a Part B drug or you have a physician administer a drug to you, most Americans have that covered. Um, if you're filling it on Part D, and let's say it's a cancer therapy, you would have a very high out-of-pocket cost. So if your step therapy pushes you to a Part D drug, the out-of-pocket cost implications could be uh, that it harms patients. So I think, you know, with this sort of really um, progressive thinking along the lines of improving competition, we also have to do that thinking about what is the downstream impact on patients. You know, we want those prices to be lower. We want to really keep premiums from growing too high, but we also need to protect patients who need expensive therapies. So I will stop with that. Great. Jeffrey. Okay, um, following up on Stacey, I do think we're going to talk about how do we improve Part D. And I think broadly it is a success from a government perspective. If you look back at projections in 2003, costs are much lower, beneficiary satisfaction is high. Dana alluded to there was real concern the industry wouldn't participate, and they've participated in grows. So we're talking about improving and modernizing a program that's been largely successful, not that it doesn't have flaws. Um, and I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but the administration should be commended for taking some bold steps towards <laughs> reforming Part D and drug pricing more generally. Um, some of the things are logical. For example, there were just design flaws in the program. The donut hole was not a smart idea. It was a, a political compromise. So then we said, okay, how do we make the donut hole more affordable? Let's put in manufacturer rebates or discounts in, in the donut hole. But very cleverly, then that counted towards your out-of-pocket expenditures, which then pushed you into the catastrophic. So we have things like that that really don't make sense that I think the administration has proposed that are logical reforms. Um, other Part D reforms, everyone is quite aware there's a growing gap between the list price of a drug and its actual uh, discounted or, or net price to consumers or to the plan, but those rebates are being generated uh, on expensive drugs taken by sick people, and they go to lower premiums for both sick and healthy people overall. 
And so both in the commercial sector and in Medicare Part D, there's been a movement towards maybe having pass-through pricing or, or rebate pass-throughs so that the people who purchase those high-cost, high-rebate drugs actually benefit at the point of sale. We're actually modeling that in Part D right now and looking at how that will change the distribution of spending for the beneficiary, for the plan, for Medicare, and how, how it changes sort of people's flow through the coverage phases. Um, out-of-pocket maximums seem to be a, a fairly, I would put an out-of-pocket maximum in general. I might even put an out-of-pocket maximum on a per prescription right. to protect. Right. But I do think we do have safeguards in Part D. We do have low-income subsidies. And so typically those who qualify uh, do have some protection, albeit you know, we, can, we can improve the system on, on the margin. But there are other issues that are coming up on the forefront. The troop limit uh, that gets you into catastrophic goes up by 30% in 2020. Manufacturer rebates go to 70% in the donut hole in 2019, so we need to make changes sooner rather than later to modernize Medicare. Then there are a few other issues, I think, more broadly that we have to think about. Um, the ACA expanded Medicaid uh, coverage, and it, it, it increased the mandated rebates in Medicaid, and so when you squeeze manufacturer revenues in one area, they tend to raise prices in other domains. Uh, the 340B program is a perfect example of a very well-intended program to lower make drugs more affordable for lower-income populations. It is almost akin to rent control, making housing more affordable for low-income folks. But over time, these programs uh, expand, and they tend to subsidize middle- and higher-income folks, which is what the 340B program does. But what that does is by lowering manufacturers' revenues for certain populations, it tends to raise prices in other domains, and I think we have to think more broadly about reform. And I guess I'll take a, one broader step back. I think some of the dysfunction of Medicare Part D is not Part D's fault. It's just how this industry functions and how we pay for drugs and the, the supply chain that we have. Um, Generally speaking, I think we want a thriving, uh, innovative pharmaceutical industry, and we tend to forget that. But when we think about advances in, in medical care over the past two decades, most of them have been in drug therapy. So we want innovation, and that you know, prices do generate innovation. Higher prices do incentivize innovation. So we want to be careful of how we regulate prices. Um, but having said that, economists tend to look at who's innovating and who's taking risks, and that's largely manufacturers, and I think too much of the cost of drugs are being absorbed in the supply chain. And there's been talk, I think the largest culprit in this in the supply chain are the PBMs. I think their value added is modest. And I think if you were to say, for example, they were covered under ERISA, the uh, Employee Retirement and Income Security Act, where if Fidelity manages your retirement plan, they have to act in the best interest of you and your plan. We don't see that on, on, on the drug side. And if PBMs were covered under that, it would change a lot of the dysfunction in this market, spread pricing, rebates, all sorts of perverse incentives of pushing a, a branded drug over a generic drug. All of those are based on the financial incentives that are built into the system. And so I, I think there's some broad issues that I think are, are bigger issues for both the commercial and Part D, and I think the administration's outlined some very constructive and doable things to improve Part D. Uh, let me start. Like, I, I'll just get it. Folks are getting interested in starting questions. I think we do have maybe one or two mics, so maybe raise your hand so we at least know where to point a mic if you're interested in, in asking a question. Let me ask Sam. I'll start and have a different question for each one of you. Sam, you mentioned kind of the need to integrate more around direct kind of consciousness around Part D or even prescription drugs or even physician-administered drugs into right. more directly into alternative payment models. There is currently kind of at least one alternative payment model in the Medicare program around oncology. Right. Interestingly enough, it's a total cost of care model, but in oncology we're learning from kind of early readouts from that model it's actually really a drug model because so much of oncology spend is, is on the kind of Part B and a growing percentage in the Part D side. Um, some of the hiccups in that model has been around timely data, uh, having some kind of model that integrates into the delivery system at point of prescribing information around cost consciousness, et cetera. Do you have from kind of your experience and vantage point. You mentioned, P, you know, prior auth, UM. I will say, as a, you know, you and I are physicians, uh, I cringe a little when I hear prior auth and UM because it doesn't necessarily, to me, lend itself 
to things that make my life easier. Not that that's the goal, but you know how. So, t- can you thread that needle a little bit, Sam, and uh, try to maybe, let's say you were running CMS and you were thinking about APMs that did this a little more aggressively. What would you do? And what would you do to maybe offer, I would say, a modernization of kind of the traditional PAUM strategy, which as we have like maybe three PBMs nowadays um, and vendors that are also consolidating under those organizations, it's only a handful of entities that are offering these programs, by the way. So I know that's a very loaded question. No, but you've made such important points in your question. The first is, and I acknowledge that Um, prior authorizations, step therapies, all of these connote um, limiting care and limiting freedom of of evidence. But if we, in fact, go to professional organizations Mm -hmm. and use clinical guidelines, clinical Mm -hmm. paths, Mm -hmm. and have those paths actually meet a whole set of criteria that are patient-centered, that are responsive to uh, best practices, to side effects, to a number of scientific and clinical endpoints, I think we can begin to get there. And, and what we did at Anthem, for example, is just one model, is we knew that, again, what we'll call Part B drugs or drugs in the medical benefit for commercial plans, that the ASP markup was a perverse incentive. Mm-hmm, right. The administrator recommend, mentioned that. You, did, you know yeah, that. Right. Um, and it, believe me, it was not 6% as yes. it was for CMS. It's a lot higher. But it was much higher on the commercial <laughs> side, much higher. So what we did is we said, how do we democratize payment? And so we said if physicians, oncologists in this program, followed clinical evidence and guidelines developed by their peers, and that could be if the therapy was incredibly expensive but the best evidence mm-hmm. or less costly, that we would pay the oncologists in addition to their ASP, but we would pay a care management fee. So we would try to democratize payment by taking away that perverse incentive of just prescribing the most expensive chemotherapy and replacing it with a patient-centered, scientifically-based therapy. That's an example that could be used. And when you look at the total cost of care, it could even be more impactful because you would choose therapies that would be less complicated, that would lead to um, longer-term responses. And it would even, over time, when we think of CAR-T therapies, perhaps the answer is to use CAR-T therapies earlier, maybe even before autologous bone marrow transplant, where we know we have costs in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's the piece that I think wasn't really um, highly emphasized although there was mention of it, is that we are spending hundreds of thousands for therapies that don't have the sustained impact. And I think these approaches can get us there. So that's, that's I think, part mm-hmm. of an answer. But what we, we do know is that you know, for state Medicaid programs, for gene therapies for children and others, we need to figure out how to best and effectively use these therapies and have physicians really, and science, guide this. the guidelines, yeah. Stacy, building on, actually, again, I think Dana pointed out kind of the obvious that, like, oncology, ophthalmology, rheumatology, at this time, those are some of the dominant specialty areas. Uh, not to say that we won't potentially see innovations in other clinical areas, but those tend to be the most associated, not just in Part B and D, but in general with kind of serious illness and accessibility. Um, Sam mentioned CAR-T, and some of the kind of nuances around or complexities around reimbursement. Uh, Feel free to comment on that. But then I also wanted to touch on, you you mentioned kind of the patients. uh, Something I was curious about, one could argue, I've argued, we might even want to move away from coinsurance to kind of co-pay, co-payments, just because when you're a patient, you understand and you can wrap your brain around co-pays, something that in the commercial sector you're traditionally kind of acculturated to, Coinsurance, I don't even know what that means. So uh, offer, if you will, uh, any commentary around where we need to evolve in our payment for some of the therapies like CAR-T and then also this just curious about coinsurance as a model in Part D. Sure. So um, for the coinsurance part, I'll start with that. You know, I've, I fully agree with you. It's, it's really interesting when you think about um, trying to tell someone how much they might pay for a treatment. Mm-hmm. 
and then having to explain to them, well, it depends on how many other drugs you've already filled. And if you haven't, you know, your first fill is going to be high and then it'll be less once you hit the catastrophic phase. And if you're in the gap, you know, it's just like literally month to month, your expenses can change. So even telling somebody kind of the average amount you would expect to pay out of pocket over the course of a year, you know, that may be helpful, but it doesn't really reflect what they pay at a specific visit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think coinsurance is a very challenging thing for uh, patients. And as the administrator pointed out, um, you know, list price is relevant when we're paying coinsurance. So, you know, you don't benefit from those rebates or discounts that are in the supply chain and kind of flowing back to um, the Part D plans. So, you know, I think as much as we could disconnect what patients pay from the list price from having a percentage-based cost, that, that would be really helpful for providing some form of stability. You know, the downside of that is, you know, we have a lot of very expensive drugs that aren't helpful, you know, in the same ways. You know, we talk a lot about the innovative cures, the really high-value treatments, but we have a lot of very low-value treatments with high price tags. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we need to really be able to use our levers around, you know, incentivizing incentivizing patients to use the drugs that are high-value. Uh, so maybe coinsurance has a role for some of these more expensive but, you know, not very high-value mm -hmm. treatments. You know, as far as CAR-T and thinking about other therapies, you know, the payment issues there are sort of really forcing us into a new area of thinking about, you know, how drugs or innovative products are covered. You know, it's, it's been interesting to see this roll out and then also hearing across different payers what they're trying to do to manage the financial loss in some cases. Um, you know, the fact that if you are treated with CAR-T as an inpatient and you're a Medicare beneficiary, your hospital is likely going to be losing a lot of money in that situation on your treatment. They get paid less than the total amount of the drug. Um, if you get the drug on the outpatient side, or if you, you know, you're treated in that way, and you're a Medicare beneficiary, the hospital might actually make some money on that to be determined. But the fact that there's different you know, reimbursement levels based on whether you're inpatient or outpatient, even under, part, uh, under Medicare, it, it just makes it very confusing. And I think it's confusing for everyone right now, um, hospitals, you know, the people trying to treat patients and patients across various insurers, um, the rules are kind of just being set as we go. And I think the industry is still, it's not as if we're done with where CAR-T is going. There's community-based trials. So aside from even kind of hospital administered, there, I mean, there is going to be a future very near where it'll be kind of a community administered treatment, which yeah. is which is going to change the scale or potential applicability in a very different way. So, Jeffrey, uh, you, you mentioned kind of pass-throughs, out-of-pocket max, and then kind of hinted. Uh, there have been just curious about whether some kind of change to the low-income subsidy, kind of the LISD program, raising eligibility, other kind of options or tweaks on those levers might be applicable. And then something I didn't hear anybody mention, interesting given light of the blueprint, which I thought the administrator might even mention she didn't, um, CAP, the Competitive Acquisition Program, kind of one of my favorites that was a big dud back in the early 2000s, but has been resurrected. And certainly the administration put out kind of a request for information that let some notionality to not only resuming or resurrecting this program, but effectively modernizing it. And do you see that as having any promise or do you see the absence of talking about that as a sign that, you know, we've learned we're one and done? So just curious. Uh, quickly on the LIS side, I mean, I think obviously we want to make drugs affordable and it's obviously a vulnerable population, typically the low income eligible and the duals. Um, so I, I think we want to, we don't want to impose any sort of significant cost sharing burden, no. but I do want to. Should them, we make it, I think, should we actually rate, you know, should we well, change the eligibility to make I think it, we can maybe steer, for example, generic use is much lower in the LIS population. There's mm -hmm. no incentive to right. go generic versus a brand in some cases from a, just a personal right individual consumer perspective. So I think there are things we can do to try and incentivize them to make better choices. I'm a Democrat, lower, so we're trying to raise, choices. we want to raise eligibility um, as much as possible. Oh, you want more, more I want eligible. more people to be
be on Ellen. Let me make that more clear. Uh, okay. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> Not raising the we want to make it more. <laughs> I'm just curious if there, there, cause there's an argument to be made that kind of the seniors of 2003, that there's different economic pressures. Again, I'm, ve- I'm and, very sensitive to pay, patient out-of-pocket costs, but at the same time, a lot of these drugs are very effective therapy, and we don't complain about paying. Right, okay. To go to the doctor and go other things in, in, in many healthcare services that are very ineffective. So, you know, the idea that we have to pay something for drugs, I don't think is abhorrent and I don't think it's controversial. Right. Uh, we want to protect people who can't afford it. Right. And how we do how that, we do that I, I think we can do that a little better. And I think out of pocket maximums for a year, out of pocket limits per prescription, perhaps, so people don't right. get to the pharmacy and walk away without the script. Mm-hmm. Those are logical things to do. As far as Part B and CAP, I think any type of competitive bidding type process in Part B would be welcome. I think. If you look at DME, durable yeah. medical equipment, that was fairly successful. And, you know, again, we, we did have a bad experience in the past, but I don't think movement towards a more competitive market, which is, I think, what the administrator talked about, right. is, is something it's hard to argue against. Right. All right. Any, uh, we've got, okay, we have, oh, we have lots of hands. Let's get a mic so that, because we've got webcasts. We're going to go, oh, there's two people. Let's go ahead and get this gentleman on my right, and then... I, over here in the front, the second row, and then I'll get you in the back, sir. Yes. Thanks, Kavita. Are they miking up somebody again? Can we hear you? Um, yes. Yeah. Can you, um, yes, go ahead. Mike Miller, I'm a physician doing health policy for about 30 years now, and I want to come back to something that Jeffrey said about you know higher prices being an incentive for innovation. I've done a lot of work now with uh, patient groups um, a variety of ways, and, you know, and personally as a patient, it's sort of the concept of, I want to have high prices for drugs for a disease that I'm going to have in the future right. so that there's going to be innovation in that area. But then when I get that disease, I want things to be lower prices. So can you guys yeah. talk about some of these concepts, CAP and all these other things, what they would do for incentives for innovation around you know, a certain population, a certain disease area, if it's just in Medicare, or if it's in Medicaid, if it's 340B? Because I think that's uh, it's a complicated concept. It came up here at Brookings' event back in... I think February we talked about in terms of closing the donut hole and the incentives that had for companies to, you know, dramatically raise their list prices for, you know, Medicare Part D drugs. Okay, great. Who wants to, Jeffrey? Sure, I'll start. Um, Obviously, we want innovation, and I think obviously there's plenty of empirical evidence in the academic literature and, and others that higher profitability in there will lead to more R and D. We see lots of R and D and and. Uh, areas like Alzheimer's disease versus malaria and TB, where the loss of life is maybe uh, greater in one versus another. So we know sort of the, the lure of richer markets and, and, and profitability is going to attract more capital and more R&D. Um, like you say, we can lower prices today, and that will benefit today's consumers at the cost of, of future innovation and maybe people down in, in next generation. So we have to be careful, and I think we can just do this intelligently by saying – Let's foster an innovative environment, and we're going to make drugs that we think are value-oriented, that are worth it, affordable to patients. Um, out-of-pocket maximums cap on, on pricing per script, for example, is an easy way to make it accessible with subsidies for low-income folks. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I don't think you can have one without the other, um, but we have to do it intelligently. Anyone, Stacy or Sam? Any? Yeah, I guess one, one just general reaction to that is I, I hear that question a lot or I I hear that concept a lot thinking about you know where rewarding innovation and you know I was part of a panel or at the beginning of the year and we had someone representing uh, venture capital which was kind of new for us at this nerdy academic conference Uh, but they said something really interesting and important they said money doesn't care about public health and it was really interesting to think about this concept of, you know, getting the innovation and rewarding innovation, but then having that money all flow to solve the same problems because there's a reward. And I think in some ways we're starting to see that happen a lot in oncology. You know, there are thousands of trials for the same type of drug uh, to meet the same target population. And you're like, eventually you're going to run out of people who even can be in the trials because so many people want to get a product onto the market. So I think one question, you know, that we really have to wrestle with is how do we get innovation in the right places so that we're not just repeating the same drug because there looks like a good market for it, but we actually have, you know, the innovation and the money kind of rewarding, you know, sort of the public health good. And I don't think we're 
anywhere close to doing that at the moment. And just very quickly, I think that no one would be critical of our lack of innovation today. I mean, in fact, there's mm -hmm. so much innovation. It's to Stacy's point, how do we uh, find models to even test these new therapies? But what is critical, and we really haven't talked about this, we've made assumptions that the current pricing structure of drugs basically remains the same, and we're looking at models of, of um, you know, co-payment and, and access. But think about innovation also means more efficient ways of doing gene therapy, more efficient ways of preparing cells. Um, mm -hmm. Scott Gottlieb has talked a lot about and is promoting new study designs, basket trials. So I think there are many ways along the innovation path where efficiency can both speed development and uh, drive a lower overall cost of, of therapies. Perfect. Hi, Joyce Frieden with MedPage today. Um, we've talked a lot about the effect of these high drug prices on patients, but what about their effects on physicians in the Part B program who might have to pay for some of the drugs in advance before they can administer them? Because I, I have heard stories about people having to get loans uh, in order to do that, and are any of the solutions being looked at that will address that? Who wants to... Uh, well, go ahead. No, I, I think that a lot of your question is provocative because most people are looking at the physician income, and when they look at oncologists and see that 30 to 40 percent of their revenue is generated by, um, you know, markups on drugs or, or again, rheumatologists. But your point, I think, is is really being addressed in the market. Mm -hmm. More and more specialty pharmaceuticals are being distributed through different channels. And even health plans and potentially in the future, CMS would look at those channels where the prices, the cost is being borne by the, the specialty distributor. It's more control over the cost, less more control over um, the right clinical setting for the drugs, and it takes the burden of acquiring those drugs off the physician. But it must be replaced, as Kavita's question was, by something else. It can't just be an E&M code. It has to be a care coordination, care management, and overall cost of care code. And I would say the more you're seeing consolidation in the oncology industry, as well as some of these others, um, the less you have, you, you're starting to see more physicians that actually don't want to do buy and bill anymore. And you're starting to see a willingness to say, I will come in in a kind of a salaried arrangement or something that has less of this risk because they don't want to keep their practice underwater. And so I think it's just, it's, it's gonna be a very interesting time if a cap type of program that could have some provider facing aspect could be successful. I think you'll see oncologists and other types of specialists that are saying, I don't necessarily want to be responsible for holding the drug and holding the supply and keeping kind of all of those things that used to be not only profitable, but to be fair, were convenient for both the doctor and the patient. We call them physician-administered drugs because they were done in my office. They were done here. And I think we're just changing how we think about that now. So, Jeffrey? Just, just a quick anecdote related to that. I was at the oncology meetings a few weeks ago, and a physician oncologist stood up and said, uh, when we were in private practice, when I was in private practice, we had a third-party vendor would tell us and provide the prices real-time prices for all the oncology drugs so we could compare them to what we were going to get reimbursed. And so we would see what our margin was on every drug, and we would prescribe according to margin. Huh. And he goes, I'm so relieved to be in a hospital now where I don't have to do that. I mean, that's not how a physician, I mean, no matter, there's a an inflection point where you, even making that much money, it's just people do not necessarily want that. And especially now that they're inundated, oncology, when I was training, you know, you had a handful of drugs. Gleevec was like the newest, greatest drug we ever had. And now it's just dwarfed by, you know, name any of the checkpoint inhibitors, immune therapy. I mean, it's mind boggling. So it's, it's not easy for care providers either. In the back and then right next to him and then we'll be done. 
both the gentlemen have. Uh, Rick Blake, strategic health resources again. I mean, we're talking about innovation as if it were just a word. It, it's not. There's a dollar sign attached to it. And, um, you know, we work with more than a dozen biotech firms with, which have innovative drugs in, in their particular therapeutic areas. So, so at the end of the day, the log jam, oh, oh and 78% of all the new drugs are developed by small to mid-sized biotechs. There, there's no real incentive for large pharmaceutical firms to, to, to want to develop new drugs. Why? Why would they want to? Um, they, they're already making billions of dollars over the existing drugs, whether they're, they're the best therapeutics or not. So at the end, at the end or the middle of the day, we have to remove the log jam the the, the 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 regulatory the regulatory and the venture capital log jam for these small biotechs to develop most of these small firms are in uh, our clients maybe stage 2b if if they get to stage 3 which is highly unlikely it's very lucky because because you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars along each of the clinical trial pathways so all right Rick, get to the question so so the no but the the point is then how do we how do we, how do we change the system so that the, the 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 therapeutics that need to be out there get out there rather than have a radios of the law stock where you have the things slapped away and put put away in in a stock room somewhere that's the question okay I feel like that is uh, a very weighty question so <laughs> <laughs> I mean you're right in the sense large pharma manufacturers are now basically licensing or 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 venture capital funding smaller uh, labs, partly because they weren't very successful. Developing a new drug is hard. Mm -hmm. And when a Gleevec comes on the market, it raises the bar. You've got to be better than Gleevec. Right. And so drug development is risky and difficult. And I think you're absolutely right. It's small and mid-sized companies that are developing new molecules and then being licensed or purchased by large pharma that, that shepherds it through the regulatory process, the clinical trials, and they market it. I don't think they're killing good, e efficacious drugs. Molecules sit on the shelf and nobody uses them. Right. I mean, I think that's the, you know, that's the way we kill things. It's, we didn't find a use or can't complexity of enrolling in a trial, right? And so then it's not, to Stacy's point, I mean, finding patients, not easy. And so it's, it's challenging financially, even if you get through the, that's why you're at 2B, right? So um, that's, I think that's where Scott Gottlieb has really stepped up to say, what can we do to cut through some of that? But then you've got to have some sort of reimbursement or commercialization strategy, which is something can, Scott can't do in some way. So, all right, I think that was Rick next to, yes. You get the last word, my friend. Thank you. Uh, Richard Smith, independent consultant. A question for Dr. Nussbaum. So um, you emphasized uh, the positive aspects of using prior authorization, step therapy, and the like, and triggered a thought that when a manufacturer brings a drug to patients, has to get FDA approval, and they have to, and that's based on an extensive body of evidence. Um, you know, with step therapy, with prior authorization and other techniques, you know, tiering and so forth, um, you know, we have a system uh, in which there isn't anything approaching that level of oversight. There are a few process standards here and there, but very little <laughs> oversight, very few real standards, very little evidence about how they operate. A uh, recent health fairs article uh, you know, identified um, step therapy sometimes requiring five steps through to a, uh, you know, step drug. That was an outlier, but, you know, they found examples. So my question for you is, if we're going to throw in with these strategies as a principal way of managing, um, what's the accountability? What are the standards with teeth? How do we know that they're working? You know, what's the... Uh, What's the, you know, kind of what's the deal with society to know that this is actually being deployed in a way that's at all useful or, or positive? Yeah, it's a really important point. Number one, start with professional expertise. Mm -hmm. Number two, based on clinical data, uh, increasing real-world evidence. The one thing about health plans that all um, generally do is approve off-label use if, in fact, there's evidence behind that. If there's follow-on studies, that's really important. Mm -hmm. So, again, the science being um, number two. And number three, the series of, of safeguards. You know, there are safeguards. Every company has their own internal review, and particularly in oncology. Um, you know, we had, and I know others have, exceptions process where clinician to clinician would review issues and, and make decisions, but also there are processes at the state level and beyond that would allow appeals to peer groups. So I think 
there's evidence that there can be a very well-developed process in place that guides effective therapy, state-of-the-art care, but limits in some way the ineffective care. Now, remember, the reason these are done, in part, is to have a more limited repertoire in your formularies, in part, so that that can lead to greater rebating. So that's the immediate, one immediate impact. Uh, I think it can be done well. And, and what we have today, though, are you know, large compendia. We've not used, and I know uh, this hasn't been raised, but uh, we've not used PCORI uh, in a way that maybe it, uh, yeah, many of us true, initially yeah. thought it would be intended. This is really where PCORI could be stepping in and, and guiding us as we look at the, the, next, the next decade for PCORI. So there are many approaches that we could all talk about that can be effective here. All right, so any, any, last, any last thoughts? Get your chance. All right, so join me in thanking an excellent panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.